One of the highlights of my time away was uh, seeing my grandkids up in Oregon. We were up in the Pacific Northwest during that really hot spell. Uh, one of the things that we did as a result of that is we had a lot of water fights. And so uh, we uh, filled up buckets with water and then we went and got some things uh, like super soakers. These are called the stream machine. And uh, what I would do, if you've ever used one of these things, you all know how they work. You put the nose of the thing in the, in the bucket of water, and then you pull it out, and it sucks the stuff in, and then you can squirt it out. Now, I have no problem doing this. And my problem is my grandkids aren't too good at this. And so they, my, my grandsons, especially, ages three and one and a half, they can't get the nose of the of the stream machine into the water and so they pull it back and then they come at me and they've got nothing at all to squirt at me and they get really frustrated because I have no mercy on them I'm just hosing them down because they're, they're killing me all the rest of the time but uh, I thought of this whole process of my water fight with my grandkids in my preparation this last week these spiritual things happen to me all the time you see our journey with the Lord and the process that we go through, much like the filling up of one of these stream machines, in order for us to really know who we are, we have to know what God has done for us. And we have to soak it in in order to shoot it out. A spiritual process. Let me show you where this is taught. If you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, Open, please, Colossians chapter 3. We're continuing our summer series called Jesus is Enough. This morning, looking at chapter 3, verses 18 through 21, and how we're to obey the all-sufficient Savior. If you want to study along but didn't bring a Bible, there's an extra one in the pew rack there in front of you. Page number's up on the screen. Here's our context. Over the last several weeks, Pastors Scott and Josh and Greg did a fabulous job of explaining one of the most profound spiritual truths in the scriptures. That the moment a man, woman, boy, girl, grandma, and grandpa believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, he or she is completely identified, completely united with the Lord Jesus in his death, his burial, and resurrection. The book of Colossians emphasizes this. Because of our faith in Christ, chapter 1, verse 22, we are now holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. That's the way that God looks at us. Because of the forgiveness that we received in Christ. Chapter 2, verse 10 says, In him you are complete. We're part of his forgiven family, not based on what we do, but based upon what he has done for us. And when we put our faith and our trust in Christ, we become brand new. You see how Paul states it in chapter 3 and verse 3? This will set our context and then launch us into our study. Because of this union with Christ, Paul simply says, verse 3, For you have died. The moment that you put your faith and trust in Christ, you received Jesus as your Savior, you asked Him into your heart, you became His disciple, you repented and believed the gospel. All synonyms for the same thing. The moment that you believed on Him, the old you hung on that cross when He hung on that cross. That's why Paul puts it in the past tense. You have died in a very real spiritual sense, you are united with Jesus in his death. You're united with him in his burial. When they laid his body to rest in that borrowed tomb, you were laid there as well. You're united with him, identified with him in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. When he came up out of that grave with new life, I, you, we, who believe in him, we were raised to new life as well. There's a brand new you, the moment that you believed. And that's why Paul, verse 3, your life is hidden with Christ 
in God. That is your spiritual standing right at this moment. So, beloved, soak it in. God no longer sees you in your shame, in your condemnation, in your guilt, in your sin. He sees you as adopted into his forgiven family. You're not an outsider. You're an insider. You're part. You're new. All because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said it this way. You remember in 2 Corinthians 5.17? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a, what's it say? New creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. The old you is dead, the new you has come to life. And that's the picture of water baptism. Uh, out on the athletic field this afternoon, we're going to baptize people. We dunk people here. Because it fits the picture of what happens spiritually and internally, the moment that you believe, is pictured in water baptism. We take the person, put her or him down under the water, Death and burial. I tend to hold people down there a long time just to make a point. <laughs> we pull the people up out of the water. It's a picture. Brand new life. That's what happened on the inside the moment that you believe. Now we get to show it on the outside. And when you get baptized in water, you are saying, Lord, I am with you and I am with all of your people. That's why we do this. So suffice to say, if you have trusted in Christ, you've made that internal decision to believe on him, but have not been baptized yet, what are you waiting for? Come on out this afternoon. We'll ask you to give your testimony, tell your story, how you came to trust in Christ, and then we'll dunk you. And all you Presbyterians that thought I was going to have you raise your hand or hold up your babies or something like that and baptize you this way, not, not, not the way we do it here. So we soak it in. We're brand new. If we don't, if we don't abide, as the biblical term is, if we don't rest, in what God has provided for us in Christ, then all of these commands that are given in the rest of chapter 3 are going to sound like a long list of rules that you and I and we have to keep in order to make God love us. Do this, don't do this. Be this, don't be that. And some people get the idea that if you don't do this, you won't be accepted by God. Beloved, nothing could be further from the truth. You are brand new already in Christ. You are fully loved. You are fully forgiven. You are accepted into his family. You're a child of God. The key now, we have to start thinking that way. And thus Paul's statement, verse 5, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body, your earthly nature, as dead. We've got to get that upstairs. There's a new me, new you, new us. And you're dead, verse 5, to immorality, impurity, passion, lust, evil desire, and greed. Those are the activities of the old you. But that old you hung on that cross. You're identified with him. There's a new you, a new me, new us. And some of the behaviors, they just don't have any place in our lives anymore. Verse 8, and, and uh, Greg used the imagery of, of old clothing. He said, put them all aside. Anger, wrath, or rage, malice, slander, abusive speech. Think dirty language. Put it all away from your mouth, verse 9. Do not lie to one another. So in other words, you getting ticked off and, and screaming obscenities at somebody, that's the old you. That's what he's saying. That's not the new you. You don't do that anymore. Not part of your life. Shouldn't be part of your behavior. 
Get rid of it. Verse 9, why? You've laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and you've put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So the old you has died, the new you is put on, and now God is in the process of changing you, transforming you from the inside out. And our part of that is to drink deeply of this imagery, to soak it in. Then and only then can we do something with it. Otherwise, all these commands, they're just like this. Go and do this, don't do this, go and do this, go and don't do this, and we'll walk out of here and go, yeah, great. We're different. And Paul drove it home, verse 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved. Uh, uh, that's you. Are you a believer in Christ? Yes. Raise your hand. If you're a believer in Christ, this is you. You have been chosen of God. God looked at you with all your sin and all your error, with all your brokenness and all your craziness and all of your personality quirks. He looked at you and said, I pick you to be a part of my forgiven family. I pick you. That's how different you are. You are now, verse 12, holy. I've, I've taken you and I've set you apart. You now belong to me. You are now beloved. You are dearly loved by me, God says. With all the stuff you got going on, I love you. Nothing will ever change that. Nothing. And it's because of that, we now, verse 12, Paul says, Put on a heart of compassion and kindness. See it? Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. What he did for you, you do for everybody else around you. And then he summarized verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Here's the challenge. Did you come to hear from the Lord this morning? Here's, here's his main lesson to us. At the moment that we placed faith in Christ, we became his representative. We represent Jesus in everything that we do and everything that we speak. And we do that by practicing a thanks-driven obedience. Verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, that pretty much covers everything, doesn't it? So whatever you say or do at work or on your campus, Whatever you say or do in your recreation or as you drive, what you watch, what you listen to, you represent him in your word or deed. But we don't ever do it to earn any salvation from him. We do it to say thank you to him for what he's freely given to us already in Christ. So every morning, you and I and we, we get to wake up and offer ourselves, thank you, Father. That's what I want to do today. I just want to say thank you for what you've given me. We just soak it in. Then we can shoot it out. This thanks-driven obedience is spoken of a number of different times in the scriptures, Hebrews 11, uh, 12, 28. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, you are secure in this. He loves you. He's forgiven you. He's got you. He has you in your grip, and he's not going to let you go. 
You're holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Since we have a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show, what's the word? What's it say? Let us show gratitude. Let's be thankful people. By which that thankfulness we may offer to God a, an acceptable service with reverence and all. So, we represent him in our politics, our sexuality, our finances, our studies. We represent him. And of all the places where we must represent him with thanks-driven obedience is in our homes. And that's what verses 18 through 21 is all about. Uh, in these few verses, what we're going to get is family directives. It's interesting. They are all present imperatives in the Greek grammar, which means they are commands to be continuously followed. And the reason why I've taken so much time to review and set the context, these directives will make no sense unless you first drink deeply. If you don't drink deeply, these are just going to be commands. And some of them, you might even think, are a little demeaning. And that old self of us is going to raise up its ugly head. That sin principle that exists within these physical bodies of ours that wants to challenge that new self all the time. We're stuck with this until the day God gives us a new body. It'll scream, this can't be right. They don't make any sense unless you first drink deeply. Verse 18, wives, be subject to your husbands. There it is. Hupotasso, the Greek verb, to place yourself under the authority of your husband. Why? In every institution that God has created, he has built into it the principle of orderly authority. It's true of government, uh, true of the church, true of the family, true of marriage. God built into it this principle. It's even built into the Trinity. 1 Corinthians 11.3, the word head is used as, in this context, position of authority. Christ is the head of every man. Man is the head of a woman, notice. And God is the head of who? Christ. Even in the Trinity, there is orderly authority. And the Son of God voluntarily places himself under the authority of the Father. It's not inferiority, superiority, don't think that. It's simply order versus chaos. And this is why when the Son of God took on human form and came as Jesus of Nazareth, his whole attitude and every purpose of his life was to live in subjection to the will of the Father. In the garden, not my will, but what? Yours be done. That's the way that he lived. Well, wives, that's the attitude that you get to show in your family. Now, some people hear this word submission, they immediately think that's demeaning, that's loss of identity, that's slavery. And for some women it has been that, because of misapplication and misunderstanding. So let me be absolutely clear. What this whole idea of being subject is not saying is that you're a doormat. It doesn't say that. It certainly is not saying to you that you can't ever speak your mind, you can't ever tell your husband that something that he's doing is foolish or unwise or stupid or whatever you want to call it. It certainly doesn't mean that you have to do anything or everything that your husband says. That is slavery. What it simply says is you're to 
understand God's principle. And your role in your family is to trust it. That's your role. And throughout the scriptures, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Just really hard to do. Titus 2, 4, and 5. Notice again the reasoning. Oh, wives, love your husbands, love your kiddos, be sensible, pure, workers at home. That doesn't mean you can't have a job outside the home. Just priority and focus. Be kind, subject to their own husbands. Exact same idea. But notice the purpose of why. Why do, why do I do this? So that the word of God will not be dishonored. You see, God has taken this principle of or, orderly authority, has placed it in his word, And then he says to the wives, trust me. Trust my word. That's the role you get to fulfill. That's why verse 18, Paul says being subject is fitting in the Lord. So you get to represent him. Because Jesus submitted to the Father's will and brought you salvation, you forgiveness. He brought you into his adopted family because he submitted. You get to represent him in your family. And every day becomes the offering of your thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now I get to show it. Doesn't make any sense unless you soak in what he's done for you. then you can actually do what he wants you to do. It's a process. Same process for the husband. Verse 19. Love your wives. Guys, that's not a suggestion. It's a command. You are to love her. Agapao, a beautiful verb that speaks of a, a willing commitment to do what's best for your wife even when you don't feel like it. That's what we're to do. You're to lead your family, principle of orderly authority, no question. But your role in your family is to lead by being the chief servant. Do you get that? Well, I'm the king of my castle. I wear the pants in this family. Well, you did. We have chapter and verse on this stuff. Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. And what's it say, guys? Come on, guys. Say it out loud. What's it say? gave himself up for her. Your role, give up what you want for what she wants. Give up what you need for what she needs. Because that's what Jesus did for you. And you get to represent him in your family each and every day. You get to say thank you. Thank you for serving on that cross for me. And now I get to do the same thing. Peter said it this way. You husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. Literally it translates, live with her according to knowledge. In other words, know your wife and live with her accordingly. And do it as with someone weaker physically, since she's a woman. And notice what it says, fellas. And show her, say that word out loud, guys. Show her honor, respect. Why? Because she's a fellow heir of the grace of life. She's just as saved as you are. She's just as much a child of God as you are. She's going to heaven just like you are. She's going to receive a reward just like you are. So you treat her with honor. 
for who she is. And figure out what she needs and do your best then to meet those needs. What does your wife need from you? For some of you guys, she needs some spiritual leadership. I don't know when was the last time you took your wife by the hand and said, come here, darling, we've got to pray about something. Let me share with you something that I've been reading and learning in God's Word. Uh, some of your wives need some affection from you. You hold her hand. Write her a nice note of what you really think about her. Uh, some of your wives just need you to talk to them. And a nice dinner out where you're at, where she's at, where you're going. Um, some of your wives don't need any of that. What they need more than anything else is for you to follow through with what you say. That door that you said you would fix six and a half years ago, go fix it! Finish what you start. This is our role. And the sin nature says, no, you don't want to do this. That old part of us, that sin principle, no, you don't want to do that. I saw this quote, I liked it. Most Christian husbands want to serve their wives, but only in an advisory capacity. <laughs> so the critical question that we're going to ask in each one of these is, whom do you represent? The old you, or the new you? When you're united with Christ, there's a new you. Verse 19, don't be embittered against them. No wife should be treated harshly. Text says, stop it. Don't call your wife honey and then treat her like vinegar. That's what he's saying. And so many of you guys are doing great here. I just want to tell you, keep going. So many of your wives are doing great. Keep going. But if this strikes home a resonant chord in it, I'll just tell you again. You've got to soak in who you are in Christ before any of this is going to do anything for you whatsoever. You don't take that in. You're going to get hosed. And your kids are watching. Verse 20, children, be obedient to your parents in all things. And it's always surprising to me, the husband says the wife should obey. The wife says the husband should obey, and neither of them obey, and then they expect their kids to obey. Doesn't work that way, does it? So kids, all the kids that are here, your role, obey. Um, the verb is hupakuo. It means literally to hear under. Understand that? You place yourself under the authority of your folks, and then you listen to them, and you follow. Pretty straightforward. This is for all children. And Paul used a very, very general term for child here. No age limit connected to it. So I would just simply say, if you're still living under your folks' roof, you're still financially dependent upon your folks, this applies to you. Be obedient to them, verse 20, in all things. You say, I have to do everything that they say? Yep. That's what it says. The only time you don't have to is when they tell you to do something wrong or to do something unbiblical. You say, Pastor, but I'm going to lose my identity. They'll take total control from me. Hmm. Critical question is, who do you represent? You represent Jesus? What did he do? Luke 2, 51, went down to Nazareth with them and was, what's the word? Obedient to them. That's what he did. And so if you 
have folks who love you enough to tell you the truth and give you some boundaries. You can sulk and you can yell and get all sour. You can go passive aggressive and agree and then sneak out behind their backs. You can do all of that. But that's the old you. Jesus obeyed so that you could go to heaven. Jesus obeyed every time so that he could be sinless and die on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin. And if you soak that in, this makes sense. Because you get to be just like him in your family. You don't soak that in. Oh, yeah, no. Not for me. This is critical. Critical for all of us. Wives, husbands, kiddos, parents. Verse 21, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Guys, we have a tendency to do that. Exasperate, uh, knock the wind out of them. <gasps> Kick them in the gut. Take the wind out of their sails. Don't be embittered. Don't provoke them to anger. Lots of different ways to translate. Don't irritate them. Don't aggravate them. And it's not just for dads. This original word used uh, different places in scriptures for both moms and dads. So grandmas and grandpas, uh, stepmoms, stepdads, we, we all have this principle. We're to encourage them. I didn't know how else to say it. Our role in our family with our kids is to be builder-uppers. Do not live for demo day. Be a builder-upper. And the scriptures just talk about this a lot. We're to bring them up. Bring them up. But if we constantly are criticizing them, if we're humiliating them, or you're fat, you're ugly, you're this, you'll never amount to anything, you're, they're going to lose heart. Verse 21. Here's the key on sight. There's some human trait within me and you and us, but especially within our kids. Criticism have a tendency to stick to them like on Velcro. You throw out something negative at a kid, I mean really hurtful and demeaning, that thing is going to stick to them just like on Velcro. But for some reason, all the encouragement that we tend to give our kids slides off of them. Just like on Teflon. And so we have to go out of our way, as often as we can, not to lie to them, not to let them live in la-la land, not to give them an award for every time they pick up their room, you know, whatever. We just got to build them up. Build them up. Why? Because that's what Jesus did for you and me. He built us up. He's always thinking the best. It only makes sense. So this opportunity, kids that you have, parents that you have, each and every day we get to say, Lord, here's my life. I want it to say thank you. Not to make you love me, not to earn your love, but because you already love me and have already accepted me, I'm already in your family. Because of all that you have done for me in Christ, I just want to say thank you to you by living the way that you tell me to live. I saw this quote, I liked it a lot. Good examples of twice the value of good advice. 
And if we just live it out. That's the way God designed it for us to live. Significant event tomorrow. A total solar eclipse. The moon is going to pass in front of the sun and block all the light of the sun. A total solar eclipse. That happens every day in our families. The S-O-N sun gets blocked by the moon, M-E, and the sun cannot shine in my family. And what I have to do is understand and start thinking there is a new M-E and I get to represent that sun and let that S-O-N sun shine through me and you and us. A thanks-driven obedience. Appropriate that we would reaffirm our commitment to the Lord. To drink deeply. Just drink deeply. Take it in and think about Him. His love for you. It changes everything. And then with a heart that's full of His love, do your very, very best to show it to your family. Let's pray. All right, everybody take a deep breath together, will you? Is it in your heart to ask for the Lord's help today? Would you offer yourself as a thanksgiving to Him? Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Thank you, Father. And I pray that you would help me, help us, in the roles that we have, that your Son indeed might shine. So again, if you've messed up, just tell them you're sorry. Ask for his help. If you've been doing this, reaffirm your commitment. Ask for his help. Keep going. We don't need to play self-sco, but to you, Lord, here we are. So, we'll leave this word with you. I pray that you would help me and help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.